whenever you study the First World War, of course, you have to remember uh, that people were surprised and that the alliances that were underpinning the relationships between states were invisible before uh, 1914, before the conflict um, began, but then very rapidly became clear. And so what I'm thinking about is what are the alliances, what are the fault lines between powers? And if you go around your mental map of the Middle East, um, Israel is in a bit of a pickle, right? You've got Oman and Yemen. Um, I don't think that they're friendly. You've got Lebanon. You've got Syria. You've got above that Turkey. Who knows what, what they'll do in this situation? They don't seem like they want to uh, do anything to offend wider Muslim opinion. You've got Saudi Arabia now, which, of course, has said that it, it's not going to do this deal, or we hear that it might not want to do this deal with Israel. And then, of course, behind everything, Iran. So what's the question with Iran? I mean, how does the U.S. navigate that? I mean, my I notice I said here, U.S. and not Israel. <laughs> yes, I, I noticed mm -hmm. that. I think that's smart. Um, we know how Israel feels about Iran. If, if they could, uh, Israel would hit Iran where it hurts, which is wherever those nuclear facilities are. Uh, and I think they probably should at this point. Um, that's, mm -hmm. That aside, U.S. has to look at Iran now as essentially a franchise of Russia. Um, because the way that the Iranians have timed their support for Hamas, and who knows also possibly Hezbollah, um, <clears throat> can only be something that benefits Putin and the Kremlin uh, in their endeavors in Ukraine. I mean, let's, let's look at this rationally. All of our attention has shifted away mm -hmm. from the European theater to the theater in the Middle East. And whilst I can't prove any collaboration between Russia and Iran, I would bet my bottom dollar that there is one. So is it very smart then you think that, um, Ed, that President Bush was tying aid, if you will, kind of all together? I mean, sorry, I keep doing that. I don't know why I keep doing Bush. He did um, speak on this last week. Uh, President Biden, forgive me, uh, who did speak about this in terms of aid for Israel, in terms of aid for Ukraine, and then also kind of throwing Taiwan into there and the concerns there uh, in that region. Um, smart for him to kind of tie it all together? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to get partisan on your show, but I think that uh, President Biden's foreign policy has been pretty good, honestly. Mm. Um, we've been we've been fighting autocracy in Ukraine, essentially using NATO surplus equipment. Um, he has avoided so far any real escalation in, in, as I say, the European theater. And then he moved the two carrier groups into the Mediterranean, which I thought was very bold. Um, but again, um, President Biden is, is a multidimensional foreign policy thinker. And he is clearly thinking about trying to restrain Israel from that trap that I think the intelligence community has also been warning about in the West. And that trap is the perception of overkill in Gaza. Um, remember that the, the autocracy would, autocracies would love to see us uh, do things that they can point to as war crimes. They would love to see the West censor its internet um, and so on and so forth in order that they can draw moral equivalents between how they run their societies and how we, we run ours. And I'm curious uh, to get your thoughts on just your reaction that the ground invasion of Gaza that we thought was so imminent has not yet occurred. Well, my, my best guess there, and I, I stress best guess, this is speculation uh, for your audience, is that um, American diplomatic efforts bore fruit and that President Biden uh, meeting uh, Netanyahu in person was effective in so much as there was at least a pause. I don't think that Israel or any other power would conduct uh, a major escalation of a war while a U.S. president was was in their territory or in any way endangered. So I think that was probably effective. Um, on the other hand, I, I wouldn't hold your breath because I do feel that Israel will continue to pursue Hamas. We, we must remember that Hamas conducted a a grotesque terrorist attack on Israel, um, completely unprovoked. It was complete disgrace and some of the most disgraceful and disgusting open source material I've ever seen. And I'm, and I'm an old hand. So this was very, um, very much uh, Hamas's aggression against Israel. Israel has to do something. I want to go to this piece you did in Barron's, um, which you've, you've touched on some of this, but this idea of this democracy trap and talk to us a little bit about it because it sounds like what happens is then we kind of really do miss either the development of certain strategic alliances um and it can obviously run afoul as maybe we're already seeing as it's played out in this in this world in maybe the last couple of years or so 
Mm -hmm. Well, you know me, Carol, I'm always desperately seeking some <laughs> sort of analytical fame uh, and uh, I make furtive efforts at catchy articles and titles and so on. The, the democracy trap is simply the idea that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't when you're a democracy. Um, if you do not punish your enemies in a way that um, other empires and other autocracies in the past have shown is effective, uh, then you are, on the one hand, maintaining your morality as a democracy, but on the other hand, you're you're letting them go. You're letting them get away with things and flip that around. If democracies do go ahead and apply firepower to um, to their blood enemies, people turn around, as I said before, and say, well, what kind of democracy are you if, if you don't mm. care about human rights? And I'm afraid we've we've now tangled ourselves up as as the West, as democracies more generally, into a position. And perhaps this is a legacy of the Vietnam War. Perhaps it's a legacy of the Afghan uh, Afghanistan War. I don't know, but we don't seem willing to really hit our enemies hard. Um, now that's a problem because at some point we're going to have to. And very unfortunately, it appears that the the next time that we're going to have to will be Hamas. Hamas has embedded itself in a civilian population. Mm -hmm. Some of those people support Hamas, a lot of them don't, and half of them are children. So again, let's go back to Putin. He would like nothing more than to see Israel, uh, the US, the UK, and others, whether in reality or in perception, doing things that he is doing in Ukraine so that he can point to us and say, there's no difference. So here I want to take the step of, you know, some of your past history where you um, represent, represented the UK government to Wall Street and the, and, and the US. And I think about, Ed, the tricky relationship of global companies to China, to the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, right? We know the atrocities that have happened and yet we continue to do business. And I understand the thinking of, well, if we're involved, we can help make things better. Okay. But that doesn't often happen. So, so I'm thinking about our investment you know, audience who are listening to you. And I'm just thinking, okay, so are companies doing what they should be in terms of standing up for democracy if we really believe in it? Or, or will they never because they have business interests? in so many of these difficult regions of the world? Well, I, I don't know if they will or not ever, but right now, no, they're not. And sometimes I scratch my head in the wee hours when I think about the um, blood, sweat and, and tears that's gone into ESG mm -hmm. uh, and wonder to your point, Carol, about where the equivalent is for human rights and democracy. I mean, human rights and democracy scores, right? Um, we have that around the edges. We have a, a sort of center left tradition of protest in some Western countries. We have Amnesty International. A lot of business leaders themselves, regardless of their politics, are upright, have integrity and want to do the right thing. But we are exposed to countries that mistreat their populations. Um, we purchase things that were, uh, or, you know, possibly made in, in circumstances that we shouldn't really accept. That's the old Naomi Klein book. Uh, no logo. But moving on from that, we now know about the Uyghurs um, and other egregious human rights issues in the world. So, But look, it's very difficult. I mean, if we've got, uh, for example, Western financial services positively exposed to Chinese growth, uh, if we've got other firms in the world, I mean, look at semiconductors that are essentially just trying to do business to keep the modern economy running, I imagine that they're hoping that the the international uh, geopolitical outlook will will calm down somehow. Uh, my fear is that it won't, Carol. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, a valid fear given what we're seeing, Carol. Yeah, it feels like it's just going to get work. Like when you talk about, you know, some similarities from the first war, world war, like I, I just think well, we're just at this very, what, well, go ahead, Tim. Well, I was just going to say, just to, to piggyback on that, Carol, I mean, Ed, it, it seems like the U.S., you know, some people would argue that the U.S. is engaged in a proxy war with, with Russia. I've, mm. I've heard that. Um, and again, not necessarily my view, but I've heard that argument. And then I would, I've heard the argument, too, that the U.S. Is, is finding itself drawn into this latest conflict in the Middle East by, by actually having a carrier, or a, I should say, a um, military presence there just off the coast. Right, Tim. Uh, right, you are. So maybe we should be talking about Bush, right? And both Bushes. Good point. Uh, because Gulf War, yeah, Gulf War Three may be just around the corner. Do you, do you believe um, that, though? Or are, you, are you being facetious or do you believe that? Yeah. I'm not being facetious at all. No, I'm, I'm sitting here on your radio show. I, I think that that's absolutely possible. Um, I'm very concerned. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it, you have to be careful with these things, because like I said in these articles, if you're someone who uh, 
worries, then you're going to get accused of, of crying wolf, and rightly so, if, you know, if things don't go the way that they look, they might be going. But, but let's play it out quickly. Uh, you know, Israel goes into Gaza, Hezbollah thrusts into the north. There's a second, third, fourth, sixth, whatever intifada it is in the West Bank. At the same time, Iran decides now's a good time for some sort of global uh, activation of any terror networks they have. Bob's your uncle, right? Immediately, you've got to get the, the only real cop in town, the, the only real cop in the world which is the United States involved somehow in the Middle East. Now, again, if I was an adversary of the United States, I'd be thinking, well, all I need to do is a third one someplace. Hmm. And, you know, I can go and take Taiwan.